Australian Wealth Builders, helping time poor executives build financial independence through property investing. Uh, welcome back. Thanks for joining us. Cam McClellan, I'm here with uh, good friend and business colleague, uh, Michael Bozza Beresford. Boz, thanks for joining us once again. Awesome, Cam. Looking forward to it. Nice. Now, we talked in last episode about becoming ready for investment. So, you're setting yourself up for success, and it's really about creating that the goals, specifically what goals you want, the timeframes you need to get there, what your current circumstance is and the path you're on currently, whether it's going to get you to your end goal, and then if it's not, what things you need to get in place to become investment ready. So I want to talk today about and delve into the book, My Four Year Old, The Property Investor, specifically around the straight line process, which is the process and then the steps that it takes to get an investment property, to manage that investment property, to duplicate and build a property portfolio. And each of those steps obviously has set tasks within it. There's check sheets in there for people to use in the book, but also there's set things along the way there that are designed to reduce risk and improve the end outcome. So if you will, mate, I want to talk through, we've talked about the idea and getting yourself ready for success. When it comes to stepping up, I made this mistake early days. I want to talk about setting up your team. So what's become known, a bit of an urban myth, but uh, I can I can vouch that it's fact is uh, that what's a conveyancer day actually occurred when uh, when I bought my first property way back when I hadn't worked out why I was investing, hadn't set those goals, hadn't organized the borrowing capacity, any pre-approval whatsoever. Went in and found a property, luckily off the back of uh, one of my friend's dad's guidance. So it actually, he was a pretty solid investor himself and has been a long-term board member of ours, Steve, so and a mentor of mine. So I was lucky that he pointed me in the right direction of the property that I purchased. But what became known as what's a conveyance a day when I rolled into the real estate agent's office, signed the contract, and he said, uh, who's your conveyancer? And I said, what's a conveyancer? So I think people can probably, well, most people won't want to dive in that deep without much of an understanding of investment. Setting up your team is obviously pretty important. It is. Let me just say on that though, uh, and normally we like to, you know, throw a bit of stuff at each other when we do these kind of things, but um, being quite serious about it, the fact that you had that motivation and weren't worried about it sweating the small stuff is part of the reason why you've been successful. So yeah, I think for our right. listeners out there, if you find yourself, you know, it doesn't matter what it is, trying to run a marathon, but find a reason to stop after 3K or find a reason to take a morning off or whatever, they're the things that you have to overcome. It's yeah. um, having that clarity and the desire to take action is you'll, you'll work around the rest of it. But Very true, very true. And you're right though, I, I knew I had more fear of not investing than investing. So I knew the outcome that, and I hated my alarm clock, mate, to be honest. That was the reason, my motivation. I went, there's no chance I'm going to listen to my alarm clock for the rest of my life. So uh, <laughs> was it? 5.30 tomorrow morning. See how you there go. go. There you go. I've got kids now. They wake me up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Setting up your team. So just like a, a good, let, let's use a footy team, right? A footy team is going to be no good if you have five superstar full forwards in your team because – there's going to be conflict. They all do the same thing. You don't have any defenders. You don't have any midfielders. You've got a complete imbalance in terms of what you're looking at. So it's important that you have the right team members specifically doing the right jobs. And I think it's the second part that's most important. What I mean by that, the people that you need to be having in your team are a mortgage broker, you know, specialist advisors, whether it be you know, a property advisor, let's say, in this or investment advisor in this instance, conveyancer, accountant, and you know financial planners for insurance and whatever it might be. Whoever you might need in, in your team, that's the team. Now, they each have a specific role that has to be played to be able to execute the function and get you moving forward with confidence. When I say playing the right role, imagine if, the, if your full forward goes into the midfield, you're not going to get a great result. Yeah, And that's why when accountants start giving clients advice on the kind of mortgage broking or a mortgage broker starts talking about property selection, that's yeah. where people start to fall down because yeah, sure. you've got your team playing out of position, talking about stuff that they're not experts in, you know, all because they bought a property once or because they got a loan once. Yeah, sorry. so you're talking about keeping them playing the role within the role and then once you know that they can do that, then it's a matter of getting you know, the difference between a, a local league full forward and a AFL level full forward. Exactly right. Yeah. And you don't necessarily have to have 
the best of the best and the team setting up your team doesn't have to be you know thousand dollar hour lawyers or anything like that they need to be competent in the role that you need them to play yeah and so for example mortgage brokers the vast majority of home loans that are set up are for people buying their own home so law of averages says that the majority of mortgage brokers out there are good at setting up home loans yeah the majority of mortgage brokers out there or the person I spoke to eight years ago when I bought my house, if they haven't been in touch with you since, chances are they're not not understanding, A, not managing your portfolio, helping you understand equity, C, not extracting that and understanding, helping you understand your borrowing capacity to be able to take the next step and leverage. It's purely a transactional focus. And a mortgage broker that understands investment structures is probably the most important asset to your team yeah, very you true. Detect the passion in my voice. I use someone that wasn't, that was commission focused. I got the wrong structure, balls that up, and it was a good nine months to get it unraveled. Didn't sure lose got- any money, luckily, but it could have been a lot worse. I'm sure you got good rates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is the number one selling tool for mortgage broker, isn't it? It's- if, if the first thing that you hear is the rate I can do is this, you're probably looking in the wrong spot. So I think that's really important. And I think if we focus on a little bit on accountants, then I want to come back to mortgage brokers because I want to drill you a bit more about the type of setup that you need to be able to duplicate a portfolio locally and also when you get across multiple capital cities. But I want to cover off accountants really quick because I've had, and we've we've got a team of full-time accountants work for us and we've got many different external accounting firms and compliance committees and investment compliance committees. So accountants form a very vital role across each of those different functions. But each of the accountants are used. The reason why I've got so many different external accounting firms and internal accountants is because each of them are skilled in specific areas. So my current business accountants, I wouldn't utilize those to manage my property portfolio. And I've made this mistake and learned the hard way by, you know, accountants missing out on depreciation schedules and things like that. I mean, that's just crazy. An accountant could miss out, you know, a depreciation schedule when doing a tax return for someone who's got an investment property. So the analogy I always use is, If you go to a doctor and you've got an eye operation to occur, you don't go to a foot doctor. But they're both doctors. They both, in theory, could handle either, but you want to get a specialist. So making sure an accountant specialises in property portfolios. I've got a check sheet in the back of my four-year-old, the property investor people can use, but really delve into the amount of clients they've got who have investment portfolios and how many properties in those portfolios is a good way to start, or whether the accountant has investment properties themselves. That's a big one. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, yeah. All right, coming back to brokers, because I think I know I've had initial issues early days with brokers and had to go through multiple brokers and multiple banks, and it took me a long time to find brokers that were really focused on investment properties because, once again, it's chalk and cheese. The 99% of brokers out there can smack out home loans all day long. If you ask them to find an investment property loan product for you and couple it all together it's going to be the biggest mistake you made, which I think you, Delvin, on talk us through the mistake that you made and without a whiteboard, try and give us a visual on the mistakes made and what you can do to ensure you're getting the right broker because you know the structure you need. Yeah, sure. Without a whiteboard, that'll be a challenge. So there we go. (laughs) So in essence, I guess the things that you can be looking out for is when you've got a cash deposit looking to buy your first property, the kind of thing that's are going to be the red flags. Uh, what's the interest rate as the first question? There's no talk around what you want to achieve, some education around the features that you need and why that loan might make sense. Yep. And specifically, how that lender fits into an investment portfolio. Now, this might seem like a pretty obvious thing, but a lot of banks have different rules in terms of how much equity they'll let you establish as an equity loan, which you need to be the deposit and costs for the next one. So effective planning is about thinking about your second and third step while yep. you're wrapping your head around the first rather than, oh, I'll do the first one now and then I'll worry about it when I get to the next one. Yep. Quite often it's too late and it, it requires a lot of rework. If you're an existing asset holder, you have your own home or an investment property with equity, the biggest red flag is when a broker wants to refinance your existing mortgage and take that across to a new bank and get you a loan for the investment property through that same bank. Now, that's the most simple way I can explain it. In an audio forum, 
what it's called is cross collateralization, where effectively your own home would be direct security against your investment property. Now, from a risk perspective, you don't want that because if something happens to you or your investment, the easiest way for the bank to get their money back is to sell your own house. And that's just making a bad situation a whole lot worse. So the kind of structures that we want to be looking at is having standalone loans as an absolute minimum, ideally a different bank, having the loan for the investment compared to the, uh, the bank that has your mortgage and that we take the equity release from. The second red flag out there is when brokers start talking about using money in your redraw of your home loan to cover deposit and costs on the property. Now, let's say that you have a mortgage of $400,000 on an asset and let's say that you have $200,000 of redraw, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, the uneducated broker will say, oh, you've got $200,000 worth of redraw and use that for the deposit and costs and then we'll set up another loan for the rest. The problem with that comes down to cash flow and tax deductibility because if your mortgage goes from 400 to 600, the only source of money you've got to service your own mortgage is your income after tax. Whereas if you keep your mortgage at 400, you sacrifice the redraw, but set up a second, what we call equity loan, yep. based on the equity in the property, then it's really transparent that the equity loan, which we're using for the deposit and costs on the investment property is for investment purposes and therefore the interest on it is tax deductible. So it makes a big difference. If you think about how much extra per month you're going to be paying with a mortgage 200 grand higher and how much longer it would take you to pay your home off compared to having a tax effective equity loan that we're using for deposit and costs, they're the main things for people to be aware of. And it's, you mentioned one word before, cross-collateralization. I think it's important that people understand the term. If I'm a mortgage broker who 99% of what I do is primary place of residence home loans and you come along to me and say, I want to buy an investment property, the easiest way for me, and I'm going to get paid the same whether I cross-collateralize or use the equity you've got in your own home as deposit for your next one, as opposed to going to that original bank, the broker's got to do a hell of a lot more work to set up the structure correctly and doesn't get paid much more, if anything. So you can see why it's really easy for a broker to do it the wrong way. So instead of going to the same bank and dragging some money out of that and cross collateralizing and we're locking them together because it's the easiest way to do it. Like you said, you've got to go to that original bank, set up an equity loan or a line of credit. So that's one loan in itself. And then you've got to go to another bank and use that equity loan as the deposit and costs for the next property with another bank. So the base is double, maybe even more than double the amount of work for not much more money, if anything, for the broker, but it's so important for the investor. It's critical for the investor if they're ever going to buy another property. Yeah, exactly right. I found this out the hard way. So, And the thing is, you don't find out about it until after the fact. Yeah. So I had my first property. It had gone up in value. found the second one. The broker at the time was like, you know, yeah, all the, the, the common pitfalls. It'll be approved quickly. You know, we haven't got a lot of time. They'll give you a discount on the rate because they've got it, blah, blah, blah. I'll get it done. And I think, great, nice and easy, excellent. It wasn't then until 18 months after that when I thought I had enough equity to be able to get my next property. I went back to extract that equity out of the, the two properties because they were cross-tied. As part of that cross-tying, I had a conservative valuation, which happens, can't change that, but I had no transparency or visibility to what had gone on there. Mm. So the bank had basically made an executive decision to use tens of thousands of my equity, additional equity to cover that shortfall on the valve to give me the formal approval. Mm. Now, if I'd been aware of that, I would have been like, well, I don't need to go to that bank. I'll try somewhere else, Yeah, get a better valuation, and I'm in control of that process. But by then, it was too late, and all they could say to me is, well, what you think they're worth and what we think they're worth are two different things. Yeah, That's why I get really passionate about the right kind of finance structures being set up and yeah, it might mean that you have more loan accounts and so on, but it doesn't add any complexity to how you manage the money. Yeah. You might pay slightly higher interest rates because you don't get as big a discounts by having everything together. But when you work out how much extra you'll pay on 20 basis points on your loan after tax, 
It's yep. a pittance compared to the uh, time and effort and mucking around and opportunity cost of being out of the market, not being able to get your next investment when you want. Yeah, so true. So if you think about it, if we're talking about this series, and we'll, we'll make it, I think, into a, a three-part series because it warrants that. I don't want to rush the next component of it, which is you know actually identifying the investment property. So we think about it, the, the previous episode we had was getting yourself ready for success, which is about your goals and really setting up where you want to be, what that means financially, and then what the steps are, what you've got currently and what the steps are you need to get there. We've talked now about setting up your team and the importance of the right finance structure and really understanding that. If you're happy to hang around, mate, I want to knock out the next one, which is identifying the investment property, which is where the rubber hits the road. This is the exciting bit, which people love. One, yeah, absolutely. One other thing that I would just add to the finance piece, yep. just because one bank gives you a particular answer doesn't mean that that's the be all and end all. Yeah, yeah. We're a good mortgage broker that understands investing can be worth their weight in gold is because they know how different banks assess rental income. They know how different banks assess tax benefits. That's a lot of extra income that you can use. They know how banks will assess the expenses associated with your investment, like the rates and the insurance. It's not a one-size-fits-all model. Different banks consider all of these things differently. Yeah. And yeah, we had a great example in the last, uh, or two, about two weeks ago, a client that had been told by their own bank, you know, no, this is not possible. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to get an outcome with plenty of surplus and buffer on a property that paid for itself. So thank goodness that client was prepared to uh, get a second opinion and check it out. You know, if you get a, a medical diagnosis you're not happy with, you're pretty yeah. much going to go and get a second opinion on it. Finance should be no different. Yeah, I think when we talked about it at the start, it was really, and my superpower is basically plowing ahead regardless of the, you know, the blocks in front of me. And that's why I've been successful in life. I think you identified that. And I have to, it's probably the clearest someone's put it to me is I will just plow through because regardless of the hurdles in front of me. And you see that these small hills that come up when people make them into mountains. I know uh, one of my good mates, actually the best man at my wedding, 80, this is uh, years ago, and I think you actually helped him with his uh, first investment property. But the frustration that he voiced to me going through the finance process when the bank lost his pay slips that he'd sent through. So he had to go to his work and get them printed out manually and then send them off and they'd lost those. And, and he had to go and do it all over again. And it was such a pain in the ass. And, and he said to me, there's no chance I'll ever do that again. By the time he'd settled on the property, he'd gone up $120,000. So I said, well, was the four hours work worth 120 grand? Do you know what I mean? So people have got to look at the big picture and go, yes, it's going to be painful. It's going to be outside of the norm of what you normally do. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it. But I think plowing ahead is the most important thing. But um, educating yeah. yourself while you plow ahead, though, and probably do it a little bit better than I did the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, thank you very much for your time today. We're going to uh, delve into some good stuff next time. I want to get into the map process, which is the reverse or the opposite way. Basically, pe people normally pick a property. Normally, they'll go out and find the investment property first. We're going to throw that right on its head and teach people how to really pick an pro investment property. Look forward to it. Cool, mate. Thanks for your time. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and may not be relevant to your personal situation. You should seek advice from a licensed professional before making any investment, insurance, tax, property, or financial planning decision. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned, and opinions and views expressed may not reflect those of the Smart Property Investment Network.